Welcome to Walking the Half Torah. I'm Tyler Merwin, and this is Torah Portion, Saab. This week's Torah Portion is Leviticus 6, 8 through 8, 36. Our Half Torah this week is Jeremiah 7, 21 through 8, 3, and 9, 23 and 24. Saab means command. As in the opening line of our text, it reads, yod heh spoke to Moses, saying, Command Aaron and his son, saying, This is the law of the burnt offering. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth, on the altar, all night until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it. Leviticus 6, 8 and 9. This week's portion continues in the heart of the Torah, Leviticus. Last week we covered the types of offerings or korbanot. Remember that korban means to draw near, or a means to draw near unto the one you are offering to. Last week we explained what the korbanot are, and this week our portion is going to give us detailed instructions on how to actually offer them. It was the duty of the priesthood to perform all of these details as prescribed by the Holy One. And we too, being a kingdom of priests, must also be very concerned about the details of our own walk in faith. The portion will end with the consecration of the priesthood. The procedure was laid out back in the book of Exodus, in the Torah portion Tetzaveh. But this is the account of the actual event as it happens. Our Haftar this week will again contrast an apostate Israel that had lost the beauty and meaning of drawing near unto the Holy One. So let's begin with a quick review. We again begin with the burnt or olah offering. The meaning of olah, remember, is to ascend or to go up, a a picture of ascending to the Holy One. The burnt offering shall be on the hearth of the altar all night long until the morning, and the fire of the altar shall be kept burning on it, Leviticus 6, 9. While discussing the olah offering, we are told that the fire on the altar should never go out. The priesthood were to keep it burning. The fire shall be kept burning on the altar continually. It shall not go out. Leviticus 6.13 The sages note that the, the Mishkan, or tabernacle, was in use for a total of 116 years, and in that entire time, the fire continuously burned. Now, sometimes when they were transporting, the burning may be just hot coals, but it never went out. It's also said that the copper or bronze layer of the altar never melted, and its wooden structure, even after all that time, was never charred. Next, we cover the meal offering or grain offering, mincha in Hebrew. This was typically wheat flour that was offered with some oil and frankincense. A quantity of three fingers of this were offered on the altar by the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, daily. So how you do this, basically your three fingers here. You would actually reach into the flower, scoop up what you could with the three fingers, and that's what went, that went on the altar. The rest was actually given to the priesthood. As in our next verse, it says, And the rest of it Aaron and his son shall eat. It shall be eaten unleavened in a holy place. In the court of the tent of meaning they shall eat it. Leviticus 6.16 Remember that only the olah, or burnt offering, was fully consumed. The rest of the korbanot had portions that were given to the priests, or to the Levites, or even to the giver. Some of the mincha offering could be brought in cook, a cooked form, but it had to be matzah, it had to be unleavened. Next is the sin or purification offering, chata'at in Hebrew. The meat of this offering is also eaten by the priest in a holy place. Whatever touches its flesh shall be holy. And when any of its blood is splashed on a garment, you shall wash that on which it was splashed in a holy place. And the earthenware vessel in which it is boiled shall be broken. But if it is boiled in a bronze vessel, it shall be scoured and rinsed in water. Leviticus 6, 27 and 28. This shows us again that holiness and uncleanness alike are transmittable. This is why the priesthood had to remain in a holy place while eating holy things. Next, we cover the guilt offering, or asham in Hebrew. Now, the sin offering, the chatat, 
was for someone who missed the mark, something more inadvertent. The asham, however, seems to imply that the trespasser had some knowledge and therefore guilt in the actual offense. Kind of goes back to the analogy of the cookie jar. So if I have a cookie jar and I have some children, maybe one of my children comes up and has a cookie, eats a cookie, I catch them eating the cookie, and say, why did you eat that cookie? He said, well, I thought I could have a cookie. Well, no, you're not supposed to have a cookie until after dinner. So at that point, that would be similar to a chatat. They missed the mark. They should have known when they could eat the cookie, but they somehow missed it. So now let's go to the asham. The asham is maybe the same child. They know they're not supposed to have the cookie, but man, that is just eating them up. It is their flesh is getting the best of them. They can't help themselves. They sneak in, they get a cookie and they have to hide and eat it. And they're not proud of it. They're ashamed and maybe even come, they get caught and they, they just, they're sorry. That, that's kind of an, an asham offering. There is a guilt there. They broke down, their flesh got the best of them, but they really, in their heart, they want to do good. And then the final one is when you say, don't eat the cookie, and the kid walks in front of you, grabs the cookie, bites it in front of you, is like, I don't care what you say, I'm eating the cookie. That is actually not chata'at or asham, that is rebellion. And there is no sacrifice or atonement for that. So next we get the peace offering, or shalomim in Hebrew. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the thanksgiving sacrifice unleavened loaves mixed with oil, unleavened wafers smeared with oil, and loaves of fine flour well mixed with oil. Leviticus 6.12 A thanksgiving offering, todah in Hebrew, is a type of shalomim offering. This offering is brought by someone who survived a life-threatening crisis. Now, the sages use Psalm 107, one of David's psalms of gratitude, to actually derive four different categories that one might be obligated to bring a Todah offering. So if you're looking at Psalm 107, the first case would be surviving a harrowing desert journey. And if you read verses 4 through 9, you'll see David speak to that. Further on in the psalm, the second case would be surviving dangerous imprisonment, and that's derived from verses 10 through 16. The third case is surviving a serious illness, derived from verses 17 through 22. And finally, the fourth case, fourth case is surviving a dangerous sea voyage. Now remember, back in those times, most sea voyages were dangerous, not like going on a Carnival cruise line. And most of them, and this was actually derived from verses 23 through 32. Flesh that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. It shall be burned up with fire. All who are clean may eat flesh. But the person who eats of the flesh of the sacrifice of yod heh peace offerings, while in uncleanness is on him, that person shall be cut off from his people. Leviticus 7, 19 and 20. When an animal is offered to Adonai, the meat that is permissible to eat is holy because the offering is holy. Only someone who is ritually clean can eat things that are holy. Likewise, if the holy food comes into physical contact with something unclean, it would lose its holiness and be unfit to be consumed, and it must be destroyed or burned up in a fire. If a person who is ritually unclean eats holy food, his soul is cut off from Israel, which is a spiritual excision by Adonai himself. Next, we are reminded of the prohibition of consuming fat or blood with the same penalty of being cut off from your people. The fat that is prohibited is not the fat you see in a nice marbled steak. The fat that is we're talking about is more gelatinous kind. It's actually found covering a lot of the internal organs of the animal. Now, the blood, on the other hand, is actually the circulating blood that's in the bloodstream, the one that you can actually cut their veins and it, it will drain out. 
And it's not the uh, red juices like when you cut into a rare or a medium rare steak that kind of comes out. That's not the blood. That's actually a different kind of material, but that's not what it's talking about. It's the circulating blood that we're most concerned with. yod spoke to Moses saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments and the anointing oil, and the bowl of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the entrance of the tent of meeting. Leviticus 8, 1-3. Next we reach the ordination ceremony for the Kohanim, Aaron and his sons. This is the last preparatory step to get the Mishkan operational. I'm going to focus on some specific items of this process. And Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. Leviticus 8, 6. First, the process begins with washing them with water. They had to take a bath. And he put the coat on him and tied the sash around his waist and clothed him with the robe and put the ephod on him and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. Leviticus 8, 7. Next, they were dressed in their priestly garments. And he poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's head and anointed him to consecrate him. Leviticus 8.12 Aaron's head is next anointed with oil. And he killed it, and Moses took the blood, and with his finger put it on the horns of the altar around it, and purified the altar, and poured out the blood at the base of the altar, and consecrated it, to make atonement for it. Leviticus 8.15 This process was done to make atonement. The actual text here doesn't make it clear if this atonement was for the altar or for the priesthood. But if we look further at verse 34, it says, As has been done today, yod has commanded to be done to make atonement for you. So it seems here to point that the atonement was actually for the priesthood and not the altar. And he killed it, and Moses took some of its blood and put it on the lobe of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. Leviticus 8, 23. This same procedure was also done for Aaron's sons. This alludes, of course, to our thoughts on the ear by the by our head, and maybe even what we let in our ear gates. Also our actions with our hands, constituted by the thumb. And where we go, which of course is our feet, signified by the big toe. At the entrance of the tent of meeting you shall remain, day and night for seven days, performing what yod has charged, so that you do not die, for so I have been commanded. Leviticus 8.35 They had to remain outside the tent of meeting for seven days. And the portion ends with, And Aaron and his sons did all the things that yod commanded by Moses. Leviticus 8.36 Rabbi David Block, one of the teachers at Aleph Beta, brought out an awesome parallel related to the ordination process that I want to share with you. Here we have seen the parts of this ordination process, and the question is, where have we seen this before? Have we seen this somewhere else in the Torah? Being washed with water, dressed in fresh clothes, being anointed with oil, having the sacrificial blood applied to the right ear, the right thumb, and the right toe, big toe, and finally being outside of a tent for seven days? If you guessed, the purification ceremony for the Metzora, or the leper, you are correct. You get 200 points. We find this in Torah portion, Metzora, that we'll actually cover in a few weeks, which is in Leviticus chapter 14. First, we have being washed with water and having to don fresh clothing. This is found in verse 8, where it says, And he who is to be cleansed shall wash his clothes. When you wash your clothes, you're going to have a fresh set of clothes and shave off all his hair, and bathe himself in water. There's the washing. Then we have anointing their head with oil. That's found in verse 18, where it says, And the rest of the oil that is in the priest's hands he shall put on the head of him who is to be cleansed. Then we have the idea of, being, of having that atonement. Verse 20 says, 
and the priest shall offer the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. And then, applying the blood to the earlobe, the thumb, and the big toe. The priest shall take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of him who is to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. In verse 14. And finally, the thing about being outside of the tent for seven days. Verse 8 says, And after that he may come into the camp, but live outside his tent for seven days. This is a pretty cool connection. But how is the ordination of the priesthood related to the purification ceremony of the leper? First, let's look at the leper, the Metzora. They lived in a state of perpetual uncleanness. They were outcasts from the community, and they had to stay outside of the camp. So what did this purification ceremony do? It was a process to bring them back into community, the community of Israel, and back into being physically able to approach the Holy One in the Mishkan. So how is this related to the ordination ceremony of the priesthood? Theirs is an almost opposite transaction, where the leper started as an outcast. Aaron and his sons were normal members of the Israelite community. Where the leper, through the ceremony, was brought into community, the priesthood is actually being separated out of the community, but being joined to Adonai. Israel is a set-apart people, but the priesthood is the set-apart of the set-apart for the service of the Holy One of Israel. Now let's jump into our half tour this week, Jeremiah 7, 21 through 8, 3, and 9, 23 and 24. Thus says yod heh vav of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to your sacrifices and eat the flesh. Jeremiah 7, 21. The Art Scroll translates this, add your burnt offering to your peace offerings and eat their meat. Because the peace offering is the sacrifice being alluded to here in the text. Adonai is scathingly telling the people that they may as well eat the meat from the burnt offering, the olah, the type of offering that's supposed to be completely burned up on the altar, like the meat that they are allowed to eat from the peace offering, the shalomim. This is because Israel has fallen into idolatry, which is considered adultery to Adonai. All of their offerings, their korbanot, which are meant to bring them near, are not acceptable to Adonai because of their idolatry. So he tells them they may as well eat them. For in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this command I gave them, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people and walk in all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. Verses 22 and 23. Of course, we know there are many sections of the Torah that give us commandments regarding different sacrifices we are to bring for various reasons. But the first commandments given to Israel were the Ten Commandments, or the Ten Words. These did not speak to sacrifices specifically, but instead the higher aspirations of actually honoring and reverencing the Holy One. To bring sacrifices without having this honor and reverence and obedience and the love for Adonai is just a pointless endeavor. But they did not obey or incline their ear, but walked in their own counsels and in the stubbornness of their evil hearts and went backward and not forward. From the day that your fathers came out of the land of Egypt to this day, I have persistently sent all my servants, the prophets, to them day after day. Yet they did not listen to me or incline their ear, but stiffened their neck. They did worse than their fathers. Verses 24 through 26. They continued to fall away generation after generation. So you shall speak to all these words to them, but they will not listen to you. You shall call to them, but they will not answer you. And you shall say to them, This is the nation that did not obey the voice of Yod-Heh-Vav-Heh their God, and did not accept discipline. 
Truth has perished. It is cut off from their lips. Verses 27 and 28. Adonai tells Jeremiah to prophesy and to warn the people, but he also tells them they're not going to listen. Cut off your hair and cast it away. Raise a lamentation on the bare heights, for yod heh vav has rejected and forsaken the generation of his wrath. Verse 29. The people in Jeremiah's time were taking Nazarite vows, but not to draw close or to be set apart for Adonai, but instead to put on a false show of piety to get recognition from their peers. The hair that was grown during this vow was supposed to be considered holy, but Adonai is telling them that it's worthless and to cut it off and to cast it away, just like their sacrifices. He tells them if they want to lament, go to the high places where they have their idols. Don't go crying to him. For the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares yod heh They have set their detestable things in a house that is called by my name to defile it. Verse 30. This atrocity was committed by King Manasseh in 2 Kings 21.7. And they have built the high places of Topeth, which is in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my mind. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares yod heh when it will no more be called Topeth, or the valley of the son of Hinnom, but the valley of slaughter, for they will bury in Topeth, because there is no room elsewhere, and the dead bodies of this people will be food for the birds of the air and for the beasts of the earth, and none will frighten them away. And I will silence in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, for the land shall become a waste. At that time, declares yod heh the bones of the kings of Judah, the bones of its officials, the bones of the priests, the bones of the prophets, and the bones of the inhabitants of Jerusalem shall be brought out of their tombs. They shall be spread before the sun and the moon and all the host of heaven, which they have loathed, loved and served, which they have gone after and which they have sought and worshiped, and they shall not be gathered or buried they shall be as dung on the surface of the ground. 731 through 82. The bones of the priests and the prophets here refers to the priests of Baal and the false prophets. This is seen as an extreme version of the land bobbing out its idolatrous inhabitants. The Talmud even states that Nebuchadnezzar, while besieging Jerusalem, actually emptied out the tombs of the Jewish nobles to house his troops in the winter, which would be a very literal answer to this prophecy. Death shall be preferred to life by all the remnant that remains of this evil family in all the places where I have been driven them, declares yod heh of hosts Chapter 8, verse 3. This reminds us of a similar prophecy we find in Revelation 9.6. And in those days, people will seek death and not find it. They will long to die, but death will flee from them. We end our Haftarah with, Thus says yod heh Let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. Let not the rich man boast in his riches. But let him who boasts, boast in this, that he understands and knows me that I am yod heh who practices steadfast love, justice, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, declares yod heh Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. Our efforts in this life can be directed in many ways. We can put our efforts towards gaining worldly wisdom, strength, power, beauty, or financial gain. But our efforts are only truly profitable when we use those efforts to seek out and to know our Heavenly Father. 
So let us wash ourselves with the living water of his word. Let us clothe ourselves with garments of salvation and of good works. Let us be anointed with oil for service, like Mashiach, the anointed one. Let us accept the atonement that Yeshua made for us on the torture stake. Let us apply his shed blood to our earlobe, our thoughts, to our thumbs, our actions, and to our big toes where we go, to have our paths directed by him. And finally, the number seven represents completion. And the life-giving work of Yeshua is a complete work. And by his work, we can now enter into the tent of our Father. I pray this teaching has been edifying. Let's lift up the name of the Holy One. With love, in Echad, Shalom.